we welcome you to this set of recordings. For those of us who have prepared them for you, it is our sincerest wish and prayer that they may become choice possessions for you as you listen and study the material which has been carefully and faithfully reproduced. The basis for this set was a three-day presentation at the Snowflake Arizona LDS Stake Center on August 10, 11, and 12, 1989, which was titled The Book of Mormon Seminar. Dr. Hiram L. Andrus and his wife, Helen May Andrus, were the lecturers on that occasion. All of the cassettes in this set, except three, were recorded at that great seminar. Dr. Andrus has added cassettes numbers 1, 2, and 17 to enrich and supplement the snowflake material. We who have prepared this set do not represent it to be perfectly reproduced, but it is presented as it happened. However, the songs, the prayers, the introductions, and some audience participations have been deleted so that the serious listener and the sincere searcher for truth will be able to better concentrate upon the material which Dr. and Sister Andrus have presented. Only this first tape will include any introductory remarks. Please use the printed material which is included with this set of 21 cassettes to supplement your listening. Please give your prayerful attention now to Dr. Hiram L. Andrus as he introduces the Book of Mormon seminar on tapes with this first lecture titled, the opening of the last dispensation, the first vision, and its theological concepts. The first vision is the foundation of the gospel in this dispensation. It not only started the great program of the Restoration, but it gives vital and important insights that have far-reaching effects and that set the basic principles of our doctrine concerning both God and man. This great theophany occurred in the spring of 1820. Joseph Smith was then 14 years of age and was living in Manchester, Ontario County, New York, near the town of Palmyra. At the time, there was much discussion on religious topics, and revivals were being held throughout the country, with party contending against party and sect against sect. Joseph Smith later wrote, In the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions, I often said to myself, What is to be done? Who of all these parties are right? Or are they all wrong together? If any one of them be right, which is it, and how shall I know it? Continuing, the prophet explained, While I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the contest of these parties of religionists, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. The reading of this passage had a great influence upon Joseph Smith. He said, Never did any passage of the Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it over and over again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. Finally, Joseph decided to apply the promise of James. Accordingly, he retired to a secluded spot in the grove near his father's home and knelt in prayer. As he prayed, a thick cloud of darkness gathered round him, and he was seized upon by a darkening power that almost overcame him. But exerting all his energies of soul against the satanic influence, he called upon God to deliver him. He later wrote, Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which had bound me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me my name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. In another account which he wrote of this great vision, Joseph Smith said, I retired to a secret place in a grove and began to call upon the Lord. 
While fervently engaged in supplication, my mind was caught away from the objects with which I was surrounded, and I was enwrapped in a heavenly vision, and I saw two glorious personages who exactly resembled each other in features and likeness, surrounded with a brilliant light which eclipsed the light of the sun at noonday. This latter statement is from Joseph Smith's letter to John Wentworth, the editor of the Chicago Democrat, and is known in Church history as the Wentworth Letter. As I have said at the beginning, this great vision sets the basic principles of our doctrine regarding both God and man. The prophet learned that the Father and the Son are two separate and distinct personages. They are as separate and distinct as any two men who live on earth. Their oneness must be understood in the sense that they are one in purpose and in glory and in power, and in bearing witness each of the other. Jody Smith also learned that in a bodily sense man is created in the very image and likeness of God. The Father looks in form and stature as man. Indeed, he is called the man of holiness. He is also called man of counsel. This gives us a vital key of insight into the meaning of the term Son of Man as it is applied to Jesus. It is an abbreviation. Christ is the Son of the Man of Holiness, or in other words, the Son of Man. The term has reference to him being the only begotten of the Father. Joseph Smith later gave us further insights into the nature of God, stating of the Godhead. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also. But the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. Before continuing with our discussion of the Father and the Son, let me say that the Holy Ghost is a personage in the form and stature of man, but he is organized from a purifying substance called spirit. As the third member of the Godhead, he does not have a body of flesh and bones, as do the Father and the Son. However, let us not conclude that because the Father and the Son have bodies of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, that their bodies are like our bodies. Our bodies are mortal bodies, and because the seeds of deterioration and death are planted in them through the fall of Adam, they are called corrupt bodies. Thus the great hope of true Christians is that this uh, corruption will put on incorruption in the resurrection, and this mortal body will be raised to an immortal body. Then the righteous will be in every way like the Father and the Son in their physical bodies. To be more specific, the physical bodies of the righteous in the resurrection, like those of the Father and the Son, will be spiritual in the nature of their organization. Don't misunderstand me on this point. They will be physical, but they will also be spiritual in the nature of their organization. Joseph Smith taught that such bodies are quickened by spirit and not by blood. Hence the physical body in the resurrection is called a spiritual body. For this reason the Lord said of the righteous, Notwithstanding they die, they shall rise again a spiritual body. Note also how Amulek explained the resurrection. He said in Alma chapter 11, verse 45, Now behold, I have spoken to you concerning the death of the mortal body, and also concerning the resurrection of the mortal body. I say unto you that this mortal body is raised to an immortal body, that is, from death even from the first death unto life, that they can die no more, their spirits uniting with their bodies never to be divided. Note this now, thus the whole becoming spiritual and immortal, that they can no more see corruption. The Apostle Paul gave a classic statement on the resurrection in which he contrasted the mortal with the resurrected body. Speaking first of the mortal body, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So the bodies then of the Father and the Son, though physical, 
are spiritual in their nature, and the same will be true of resurrected man in eternity. In addition to these basic points of doctrine concerning what may be called the corporeal nature of God, Joseph Smith's first vision gives us vital insights into what may be referred to as the divine nature. The Father and the Son each have a corporeal nature, their bodies of flesh and bones. They also possess a divine nature, which it is vital that we see and to a degree understand. To see what is meant by the divine nature, let me read again from the prophet's account of the first vision. He said, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun. Think seriously for a moment what he is saying. He saw a brilliant light which eclipsed the light of the sun at noonday. This light centered in these two glorified personages and was part of their organization as divine beings. Speaking of them in this sense, Joseph Smith said, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. The prophet could not begin to describe them in the sense of their divine nature. Again, the Father and the Son are glorified beings. It is not enough if we are to become like them to receive a physical body and be forgiven of our sins and be resurrected. We must also be glorified with the glory and power of the celestial kingdom. Besides giving man a physical body and a remission of sins, this is the great purpose of the plan of life and salvation, to endow him with the divine nature of God. We must therefore learn of God's divine nature and how we may partake of his glory so as finally to be made like him in every way in the resurrection. To begin, let us make sure that we understand the objective clearly. The great purpose of the gospel is to make us like the Father and Son in every way and to bring us back into their presence to dwell with them in celestial glory. Joseph Smith once explained. God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Flesh and blood cannot go there, for all corruption is devoured by the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. When our flesh is quickened by the Spirit, there will be no blood in this tabernacle. Some dwell in higher glory than others. Immortality dwells in everlasting burnings. All men who are immortal dwell in everlasting burnings. This is a little different view of God and of salvation than we sometimes see. God dwells in everlasting burnings, and we must learn to come up to that same glorified state. For example, the prophet Joseph Smith, in reporting a great vision that he received in January of 1836, had this to say, The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God and the glory thereof. Whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which was like unto circling flames of fire, also the blazing throne of God, whereon was seated the Father and the Son. We have all read the 24th Psalms, which says, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. But have we read and pondered upon the similar statement of Isaiah, found in Isaiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16? He declared, Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Now note his answer. He that walketh righteously, that speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. Let me suggest that if we were to turn the old sectarian concept of God and hell upside down, we would have the beginning of the Latter-day Saint concept of heaven. This would be the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of our concept of heaven. 
We must, however, distinguish between the terms that are used in speaking of heaven and hell. Note how the prophet Joseph Smith did this. He said, speaking of the resurrection, some shall rise to the everlasting burnings of God, for God dwells in everlasting burnings, and some shall rise to the damnation of their own filthiness, which is as exquisite a torment as a lake of fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone here refer to the inner torment within those who are cast out into outer darkness. On the other hand, everlasting burnings refers to a greatly energized state in the presence of God. The appearance of the angel Moroni illustrates the kind of beings we can be in the resurrection. Oliver Cowdery wrote a description of this heavenly being. Of Joseph Smith's prayer that evening in September 1823, Oliver Cowdery said, While continuing in prayer for a manifestation in some way that his sins were forgiven, endeavoring to exercise faith in the scriptures, on a sudden a light like that of day, only of a pure and far more glorious appearance and brightness burst into the room. Indeed, to use his own description, the first sight was as though the house was filled with consuming and unquenchable fire. This sudden appearance of a light so bright, as must naturally be expected, occasioned a shock or sensation visible to the extremities of the body. It was, however, followed with a calmness and serenity of mind, and an overwhelming rapture of joy that surpassed understanding, and in a moment a personage stood before him. Notwithstanding the room was previously filled with light above the brightness of the sun, as I have before described, yet there seemed to be an additional glory surrounding or accompanying this personage, which shone with an increased degree of brilliancy of which he was in the midst. And though his countenance was as lightning, yet it was of a pleasing, innocent, and glorious appearance, so much so that every fear was banished from the heart, and nothing but calmness pervaded the soul. Let me discuss some of the things we know about glory. Section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants is a very important revelation, because it gives us key insights into the divine nature of God its relationship to the Father, to Christ, and to man. This revelation gives us the testimony of John concerning Christ's acquisition of the glory of the Father. Beginning with verse 12, John said, And I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at the first, but received grace for grace. The term grace, scripturally, has reference to a gift a gift that's unearned, not necessarily unmerited. A proper definition would be that grace is unearned divine assistance. And here John is talking about Christ's acquisition of the divine nature, and he says that he received not of the fullness at first. So he started with something less than the fullness, but received grace for grace. The term grace for grace carries the connotation that Jesus had to give grace to others in order to receive grace from the Father. Hence, John says that he received grace for grace, or in other words, he received grace from the Father as he in turn gave grace to others. Thus, service during the will of the Father was the key to Christ's spiritual development. Now John continues, saying of Christ, and he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received the fullness. The term grace to grace carries the idea of going from one step to a higher step, or one endowment to a higher endowment, so that by receiving grace for grace, Jesus then went from grace to grace, one endowment upon another. Finally, John bears this testimony, saying, and I, John, bear record that he received a fullness of the glory of the Father, and he received all power, both in heaven and on earth, and the glory of the Father was with him, for he, that is, the Father, dwelt in him. Having given this explanation and testimony, the Lord then explained how important it is for us to understand about the divine nature. Here he said, 
I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship, and that you may know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name, and in due time receive of his fullness. For if you keep my commandments, you shall receive of his fullness, and be glorified in me, as I am in the Father. Therefore I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. Note the important points in this statement. First, man does not know either how to worship or what he worships until he knows something about the divine nature or the glory of God. Second, the great purpose of the gospel or of true worship is to come unto the Father in the name of Christ and in due time receive of the Father's fullness. Third, the glorious promise, and it is a glorious promise beyond man's present power to comprehend, is that if we keep God's commandments, we will be given a fullness of the glory of God and be glorified in Christ as he is glorified in the Father. This revelation also gives vital insights into what constitutes God's glory. In verse 28 it states, He that keepeth his, that is, God's commandments, receiveth truth and light until he is glorified in truth and knoweth all things. If one is glorified by receiving truth and light, then it follows that glory consists of truth and light. And it's with this background that the Revelation continues stating, The glory of God is intelligence or in other words, light and truth. It then adds, and light and truth forsake that evil one. Can you imagine a being with a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, who has centered in him living spiritual powers of glory or intelligence to such a concentration that the radiance of his glory would eclipse the light of the sun at noonday? What are the powers of mind of such a being? What are the depths to which he can probe in intellectual analysis? What joy does he feel in the feedback that comes to him by the application of such divine intelligence? How would you like to be such a being? What could you then do to beautify your environs, to fulfill your righteous desires and aspirations, and to make your life happy? How would you like to be on the other side of the grave, with death behind you, with a perfected, resurrected body endowed with a fullness of the glory of the Father? Then how would you like to have standing by your side a companion whom you truly love as you love your own life, and have that person likewise endowed with a fullness of glory and united with you in the eternal marriage relationship? People used to refer to that pleasant sensation you feel when you are dating the one that you love as sparking. This would not be mere sparking, but full-fledged flame-throwing throughout all eternity. Seriously, though, how would you like such blessings? What could you then do to make your existence meaningful? Little wonder the scripture states that mortal eye hath not seen, neither hath mortal ear heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of mortal man that which God hath prepared for those who love him and keep his commandments. Another thing we learn about God's glory is that it consists of his Holy Spirit, of that intelligent power or essence that centers in his person and that emanates to fill the immensity of space. Let me give some illustrations to support this statement. After Moses had seen the burning bush, which was merely an expression of God's glory, and before he went back to Egypt to deliver the Israelites from bondage, he was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain. The record states, And he saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses. Therefore Moses could endure his presence. Moses later bore testimony of his experience, stating, But now mine own eyes have beheld God, but not my natural, but my spiritual eyes. For my natural eyes could not have beheld, 
for I should have withered and died in his presence. But his glory was upon me, and I beheld his face, for I was transfigured before him. Note that Moses was transfigured by God's glory so that he could endure the presence of God. By revelation to Joseph Smith, the Lord said, No man hath seen God at any time in the flesh except quickened by the Spirit of God. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God, neither after the carnal mind. Here it states that man can only behold God when he is quickened by the Spirit of God. But Moses was quickened by the glory of God. This is not a contradiction because God's glory is his Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of the glory of God. Again, another illustration. When the experience Moses had was over, the scriptural record states, and the presence of God withdrew from Moses, that his glory was not upon Moses, and Moses was left unto himself. And as he was left unto himself, he fell to the earth. After God's glory or presence withdrew, Satan came to Moses, tempting Moses to worship him. But he exclaimed, Blessed be the name of my God, for his spirit hath not altogether withdrawn from me, or else where is thy glory, for it is darkness to me. Even though God's glory had measurably withdrawn, Moses declared that God's spirit had not altogether withdrawn. Again, the term glory of God and spirit of God are used as interchangeable terms. Section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants makes the same point clear. In verses 4 and 5, the Revelation speaks of the glory of the celestial kingdom which is manifest through Jesus Christ. Speaking of this light, which we understand to be the light of Christ or the spirit of God, it states, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God, who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Here we are told how God is everywhere present, that is, omnipresent. He is not everywhere present in a physical or corporeal sense, but God is everywhere present in respect to his glory. His glory is part of his organized being. It emanates from his person and immediate presence to fill the immensity of space. Thus, in a very real sense, God is in and through all things. That is, he is everywhere present. Let me use an illustration, something to which we can liken God. In some respects, it can be said that God is like a great magnet. A magnet is a tangible object, limited in one sense to its physical form and dimensions. But there are powers and properties that center in it, that extend beyond the physical object into the magnetic field that it creates. Likewise, the Father is a tangible being, but his glory centers in him and extends beyond his physical person to fill his vast domain. He is, therefore, in and through all things. As section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants gives us further insights into God's relationship to the universe through his glory or Holy Spirit, it testifies clearly of the omnipresence of God. Verse 41 of that revelation is what I call a prepositional scripture. An English teacher once explained to me that a preposition is anything that a worm can do to an apple. It can go in, through, around, etc., the apple. This revelation states of God, He comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, and all things are round about him. Now note this. And he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him and of him, even God, forever and ever. Truly, God is everywhere present. He is as near to you as you are to yourself. The fact is that, to a degree, God's divine nature is in us, even now and we are in him. 
the life which we possess as organized beings is an expression of his glory which dwells in us. The same is true of all created things. Having referred to the many kingdoms of life which he has created, God said, Behold, all these are kingdoms, and any man who hath seen any or the least of these hath seen God moving in his majesty and power. I say unto you, he hath seen him. Nevertheless, he who came into his own was not comprehended. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Nevertheless, the day shall come when you shall comprehend even God, being quickened in him and by him. Then shall ye know that ye have seen me, that I am, that I am the true light that is in you, and that you are in me. Otherwise, you could not abound. Note that if we have seen the least of God's creations, we have seen God, not necessarily his corporeal being, but an expression of his divine nature that dwells in all things and that quickens all things, so that the organism we see is an expression or revelation of God's glory. Here is how Charles W. Penrose expressed this fact. If you see a living blade of grass, you see a manifestation of that spirit which is called God. If you see an animal of any kind on the face of the earth having life, there is a manifestation of that spirit. If you see a man, you behold its most perfect earthly manifestation. And if you see a glorified man, a man who has passed through all the various grades of being, who has overcome all things, who has been raised from the dead, who has been quickened by the Spirit in its fullness, there you see manifest in its perfection this eternal, beginningless, endless spirit of intelligence. Such a being is our Father and our God, and we are following in his footsteps. He has attained to perfection. He has arisen to kingdoms of power. He comprehends all things, because in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is a perfect manifestation, expression, and revelation of this eternal essence, this spirit of eternal, everlasting intelligence, or light and truth. The knowledge of the divine nature of God also helps us understand how God is omniscient, how he knows all things. His glory or his Holy Spirit, the chief characteristic of which is intelligence, emanates from his person to fill the immensity of space. In doing so, it conveys to him a knowledge of all things that are going on in his vast domain. Note what this scripture says as it speaks of Christ in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 38, verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I Am, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the same which looked upon the wide expanse of eternity and all the seraphic hosts of heaven before the world was made, the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. Let us look at an example or an illustration. When Moses was caught up to the high mountain and communed with God face to face, he was given a foretaste of celestial life. He was in some degree empowered to see as a celestial being can see. The scripture report states, Moses cast his eyes and beheld the earth, yea, even all of it, and there was not a particle of it which he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. And he beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not, and he discerned them by the Spirit of God, and their numbers were great, even numberless as the sand upon the seashore. And he beheld many lands, and each land was called earth, and there were inhabitants on the face thereof. Can you imagine how it would be to have this kind of experience, to see every particle of the earth and every soul who lived upon it, all at one single glance? If Moses, endowed with but a degree or a part of God's glory, could by that means see these things, what can the Father do? Jesus said that not even a sparrow falls without the Father. Here is another great truth we should understand and appreciate. Though we cannot see God, he can see us, 
personally and individually. To Enoch the Lord said, Wherefore I can stretch forth mine hands and hold all the creations which I have made, and mine eye can pierce them also. As Latter-day Saints, we believe that God is omniscient, that he knows all things. Jacob, the brother of Nephi, therefore exclaimed, O oh, how great the holiness of our God, for he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. This fact, Joseph Smith declared, is vital and important as a basis upon which faith in God can be engendered in man. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. For it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things, from the beginning to the end, that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. If we do not believe or know that God knows all things, uncertainty would prevail over our faith in him. God's knowledge includes a knowledge of the future of this earth and that which will take place upon it. God never gets himself into a box canyon where he has to repent and back out. For this reason, Joseph Smith revised the statement in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, which states, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. The prophet revised this to read, And it repented Noah. And his heart was pained that the Lord had made man on the earth. An understanding of the divine nature of God is also the key by which we can understand the omnipotence of God, the fact that he has all power. The glory that emanates from God to fill the immensity of space quickens and gives life to all things, and it governs all things. In speaking to Adam, God referred to his divine nature as, and I quote, that which knoweth all things, and hath all power, according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment, end quote. These are self-imposed limitations on the power of God. In this brief presentation, we have seen some of the great concepts and doctrines that have their basis in Joseph Smith's first vision. There are many others. It is vitally important that we understand that the Father, the man of holiness, is a distinct personal being, and that man was created in his very likeness and stature, not merely in that man has mental powers or the powers of rational thought, but we are created in his image, in the image of his corporeal body. It is equally important that we know that Jesus Christ is a separate and distinct personage from the Father. The Father and the Son are two separate beings, as distinct from each other as any two people on this earth. Think how the revelation of this simple fact helps us to avoid some of the great errors that have crept into the Christian world through the great apostasy that followed the death of Christ's apostles. Apostate concepts pertaining to the oneness of the Father and the Son have largely destroyed this simple fact in the Christian world. Equally important is the fact that the Father and the Son have bodies of flesh and bones as tangible as man's body. This fact helps us to see a purpose for life that we cannot otherwise see. We are here, among other things, to get a physical body as a means of becoming like God. He has a physical or corporeal body. To become like him, we must also have such a body. There is not only an immediate but an eternal purpose in obtaining a physical body. The flesh that we receive here must be sanctified and prepared to be made like God's incorruptible body in the resurrection. That is, it must be prepared to be made a spiritual body in the resurrection of a celestial nature. Much could be said on this great subject. Finally, it is infinitely important that we understand that the Father and the Son possess a divine nature. 
That is, they are glorified personages. They have centered in them, as part of their organized beings, divine intelligence with all its related attributes and powers of life and truth and light to such a point of concentration that the radiance of their glory eclipses the light of the sun at noonday. The knowledge of God's divine nature helps us understand his relationship to the universe. In a literal sense, God is in all things. He is everywhere present. In section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 35, the Lord said, The elements are the tabernacle of God. Yea, man is the tabernacle of God, even temples. This does not merely mean that God has a tabernacle made up of some elements of the universe, but that all the elements of the universe are his tabernacle. His glory dwells in them. Though God is a distinct personal being in the form and stature of man, he is an immanent being. In a very real sense, he is in and through all things, not merely by his influence, but by his glory which is part of his organized being, his divine nature. Only by understanding to a degree the divine nature of God can we also see how God knows all things. His glory pervades all things and dwells in all things, because it is a living and intelligent power and is part of God's being as a glorified personage. It manifests a knowledge of all things. Thus God knows all things, not just that he knows all the facts relating to the universe and how it was organized and how it is sustained. He sees and feels and understands all things. When Enoch was enveloped in the glory of God so that, to a degree, he had the same kind of relationship to the universe as God has, he looked upon the wickedness of men. The record in Moses chapter 7, verse 41 states that he then wept, and his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. He was in tune with the universe. Finally, an understanding of the divine nature of God helps us to see how it is that he has all power. Power derives from organization. It is the product of organization. By organizing all things and sustaining them by his spirit or glory, then subordinating all things to himself in truth, God possesses all the power that exists. He therefore has all power. May I bear you my humble testimony to the truth of these sacred principles and to this eternal destiny which is open to man through the great plan of life and salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.